Good morning, friends. Uh, in this time when we are no longer permitted for safety reasons uh, to gather for corporate worship, I pray that you are all keeping safe and keeping well. I must admit that it feels a little bit strange not being able to see you, uh, but I pray that uh, today's message will be received um, with God's grace. I wanted to share with you this morning some words from John's Gospel, chapter 9, reading from verse 39 to 41. There Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard him say this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? But Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. In these words which come to us from the end of our gospel reading for today, Jesus alerts us to a kind of sight, spiritual sight, which we can never have on our own terms, but which we may indeed receive as a gift only by listening to and following the voice of the living God. It is spiritual sight in the sense that it allows us to see this world and to see ourselves within it for what it really is, that is, to see it as a broken creation which is in need of the God who in fact comes among us to save us and to rescue us. The account of Jesus' healing of the man born blind, which leads to this contentious confrontation with the Pharisees, is somewhat of an object lesson about the limitations of our perception apart from spiritual sight. Limitations which we knowingly or even unknowingly put in place with regard to what we are willing to see. Without the benefit of spiritual sight, we are condemned to perceive only outward appearances and often on our own terms. And so encountering this man who was born blind from birth, Jesus' disciples assumed, as many likely did, that his blindness was a punishment, that it was some kind of consequence of sin, that either he or his parents had sinned such that he was born blind. But Jesus said to them, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. And so by these words, he opened their eyes to perceive this man's physical blindness for what it really was, a symptom of the brokenness and sinful chaos into which this world has fallen, and indeed an occasion for God's healing, for God's redeeming works in this world to be made known. So Jesus, from the dust of the ground, formed, as it were, new eyes for this blind man. He sent him to wash in the pool of Siloam, and we are told that he returned able to see. By this formerly blind man's own testimony, he said, Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. It was a powerful sign of Israel's God at work in Jesus. But yet John makes it clear that not unlike a courtroom drama, right, the same evidence of this miraculous action is interpreted in two completely different ways. On one hand, the formerly blind man, he believed Jesus to be a prophet who obviously worshipped and obeyed God and did his will since God had listened to him. He was following the evidence of what he heard and what he felt because he had never actually seen Jesus until after he had been expelled from the synagogue. He only heard Jesus' voice. He only felt the touch of his healing fingers on his eyes, and in faith he obeyed his instruction to go and to wash in the pool of Siloam. But Jesus later found him, and Jesus raised the question of faith. He said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And indeed, this man comes to faith. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And so, friends, this man was willing to follow the breadcrumbs, if you will. He was willing to believe the truth. He was willing to believe that this Jesus who now stood before him was much more than just a prophet. That he was, in fact, the son of the, the living God. Now, some Pharisees, on the other hand, they interpreted 
uh, Jesus' actions as those of a sinner, of one who could not possibly be from God because in their estimation uh, he violated the Sabbath. And so they claim not to know his origins. We do not know where he is from. He certainly didn't fit their mold in terms of who Israel's Messiah should be. And so John alerts us to the fact that they had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And so not like, not unlike rather any form of, of uh, prejudice, it meant that they were not really willing to, uh, to see him for who he was. In fact, they could not see him. They were unwilling to see him. And so their physical sight, therefore, degenerated even further into the dullness of blinded sight. They were unwilling to either trust or to believe in the words and in the works of this Jesus. And it made it so that they could not see. And so Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees, it teaches us and it reminds us that spiritual blindness is not so much a punishment imposed by God because of sin, as it is the consequence which ensues whenever human beings turn away from God and when they in fact refuse to see. When we determined to construct and to live within a system that never invokes the question of God because we presume that the truth about this world and ourselves within it may indeed be known apart from attending, paying attention to the God who has determined to reveal himself among us. When we think that we can know ourselves or this world apart from the God who created it, then we have indeed gone astray. We have become blind. This is our human predicament into which Jesus' coming brings judgment. For we have eyes, but for self-serving reasons, we are routinely unwilling, or perhaps for that reason we are unable to recognize the truth. I remember when my uh, eldest daughter was about uh, two and a half years old, uh, we were reading one of the stories from her storybook Bible one morning, and it was the story entitled The Terrible Lie, and it was about the sin of Adam and Eve, uh, which we remember from the book of, of Genesis chapter 3. And so in this story, it told about the beauty and perfection of their garden home, and of Satan who came and disguised himself like um, a serpent. And so the author writes, Now God had given Adam and Eve only one rule. Do not eat the fruit of that tree. God told them, because if you do, you'll think that you know everything. He says, you'll stop trusting me. And then death and sadness will come. And then this uh, stark note is added. The author says, you see, God knew that if they ate the fruit, they would think they did not need him. They would try to make themselves happy without him. But God knew that there was no such thing as happiness without him. And life without him wouldn't be life at all. And so Satan, of course, finally seized his moment to sow the seeds of doubt, tempting an Adam and Eve to believe the lie rather than to believe the truth. And so they believed the lie that God doesn't love me. And so the spiritual blindness that we all experience uh, is part of this fallout from our sin. For it causes us not to trust God. It causes us to think uh, that we see and know everything and therefore do not need God. It emboldens us to try to make ourselves happy without God. And when we strive after this non-existent, form of happiness, we lose both our willingness and our ability to see and to recognize uh, God's truth. There is a, a common saying that a colleague of mine uh, shared with me once that says, there are none so blind as those who will not see. The most deluded people are those who choose to ignore what they already know. There are none so blind as those who will not see. And the most deluded people are those who choose to ignore what they already know. 
But thanks be to God that in Jesus Christ, God has come among us in the flesh of his own humanity in order to heal our blinded sight. And Jesus says to us, And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. And so it should suggest to us that a kind of humility is required on our part in order to see, in order to truly hear and follow the voice of this living God, this living word made flesh. Jesus says to us that I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. The living God is at work in our lives and in the communities in which he has placed us by his divine providence. And this reality therefore begs the question, the central, centrally important question, I believe, for all of us. How may we know whether or not we truly see? Especially when we read or when we listen to our uh, Old Testament lesson from the book of the prophet Samuel, we find ourselves uh, tempted like Samuel to look at the outward appearances. How do we How do we know that we see when our perception of ourselves and our perception of others is so easily swayed by others' opinions? How do we know that we truly see when Satan himself, who once disguised himself as a serpent in Genesis, now more deceptively disguises himself even as an angel of light? Where may we find certainty about what we know, and about the truth of what we see. Paul suggests to us um, that certainty and truth may be found by following the patterns of Jesus' own life, by following the breadcrumbs, if you will. And so he encourages us in the uh, letter to the Ephesians to live as children of light, to try to find out Uh, what it is that is pleasing to the Lord, to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead to expose them. And so in our ongoing Christian journey, uh, that very struggle to discern and to recognize the truth and the light of what we see is the means of our participation in this, this battle that is going on between light and darkness, which continues to rage on. And so ours is a struggle to discern not only the truth about the sin and brokenness of this creation, but but also the image and likeness of God in our neighbor. It's a struggle to see God in one another, beneath all the layers of sinful misjudgments that we often superimpose upon one another. As Christians, we confess that seeing this world and seeing ourselves within it. And for what it really is, it requires humility. It is nothing less than a gift. We receive our sight first by learning how to follow this one who is more than a prophet, this one who has come to us from God, this one who is God. We we learn to see by following this one who is in fact the Son of Man. And so like the blind man who knew that he could not see, we may attend to Jesus. May we truly attend to him. May we follow him. May we trust him. May we obey him, knowing that in him the dullness of our blinded sight may indeed be healed, may indeed be restored, may indeed be redeemed, may be made new. Let us pray discerner of hearts. You look beneath our outward appearance and you see your image in each and every single one of us. Banish in us, O Lord, the blindness that prevents us from recognizing truth so that we may see the world through your eyes and also see it with the compassion of this Jesus Christ who has redeemed us. We ask and we pray these things through Christ, who is our Lord. Amen.